Welcome, Trust Builders. I'm Sue Dyer, and this is Lead with Trust, where we explore how leaders can build their business on a foundation of trust and reap the rewards of becoming the top performer in their market. Leaders that understand how to use and leverage trust are uniquely positioned to disrupt their industry and dominate their market. Distrust of businesses and business leaders is at an all-time high. Trusted businesses must have trusted leaders, and your team, your customers, and your vendors are waiting for you to step up and elevate the level of trust in your business. My hope is that this podcast can help you start your trusted leader journey. Well, welcome, David Richter, to Lead with Trust. I'm so glad you're here today. Thank you for having me, Sue. Honored to be here. So you have had some exciting times with a brand new book just launching. So tell us about your new book. Sure. So I just launched Profit First for Real Estate Investing. And that is a derivative book of Profit First by Mike Michalowicz and specifically for the real estate investing uh, market. That's my background is real estate investing. So I know real estate investors and and that cash flow system and wanted to make sure that there was a book specifically for them to help them as much as possible. That sounds awesome. I love real estate myself. So awesome. my, my grandfather on my father's side was a, a developer. Awesome. And my grandmother on my mother's side was a developer. Huh. <laughs> it's wow. in my blood. Yeah, no kidding. I always ask each guest this crazy question. So when you were in high school, what group did you belong to? I, <laughs> great question. I was on, I was in band. So I was in the band, I was in the band, played the tenor saxophone, also played sports too, but I was in a bunch of different <laughs> groups in high school, but that was probably the one that I resonated with me the most. So what did you learn from being in the band? Oh, learning to work together. I also learned, you know, music, music is really a window into the soul and into your emotions. I think it's just a, it's a great thing, but yeah, it's, that's one of the biggest things I, I got out of it. And do you still do your music any? Not, not as much. No, I don't play my instrument. I don't even have it anymore, but it's i uh, I've got a four-year-old daughter now. And I just told her, you know, that I played the saxophone in high school. She's like, no way. And, you know, so now I, I know I'll probably be getting her an instrument here in the near future. That's so fun. It's so fun. So, so I know you have a, your business and I believe this is your second book. I guess technically, yes, it yeah. is my second book. This is like the first official one where we went all out. <laughs> the all out book. All out book. <laughs> That's right. right. So tell me a little bit about the journey you've taken uh, to build your business, sure. uh, which is simple at CFO solutions.com. Yeah. So, so here we go. Here's the journey. So I started in real estate investing by reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So a book like 10 years ago, 11 years ago, I read that in college and a good friend gave that to me. So that gave me the real estate bug. So I started doing real estate, started working with a company that was doing about, I don't know, 25, 30 deals a month. So they were doing a pretty good volume between the stuff you see on HGTV and like doing rentals and uh, you know other things as well too. So that's where in that company as well, I was doing some of my own deals on the side, but we were also, you know, building that company to about 25 or 30 deals a month. So a good size company. And I was privileged enough to sit in a lot of the different seats there and like acquiring properties, selling the properties, property management, like managing tenants, project management, managing the actual projects and the rehabs. And one of the seats I sat in was the finance seat. And I did like that because that was one of the last seats I sat in. So I'd already sat in a lot of the seats inside of the organization. Then I got to see like from marketing to get a house from to selling the house or renting it, how the money flowed. Like once I sat in that seat, I got a lot of that education and just dove deep into it. And we were doing six or seven figure months sometimes, but some, and a lot of the times we were having six or seven figure expense months too, you know, like in the same. So it's like, we were just spinning our wheels going nowhere. 
And that's where one of the big things that hit me across the face of like, I bet you this happens a lot just to entrepreneurs. Like it's very easy to get caught up in the expenses and get caught up, like just trying to grow at all costs. So that was kind of very eye opening for me. So then I started working with another investor in Virginia because we moved, I sold my portfolio. Lots of things happened after five years of being there. So I moved across country, started working with another investor. And the first thing I said to him was like, I want to see your numbers. Like that's the most important thing to me. So I can know how your business is, how it's, you know, where are we going? And I dove in and like a lot of investors, there was nothing really there that I could use or like really interpret because it was a mess. So I went in there and helped him clean that up. And after that, he had a lot of his own money tied up in his property. So meaning he could cash out or refinance a lot of his houses because he had poured a lot of his own hard, hard earned money into it. And he didn't even know like where a lot of his money had went. And I'm like, well, here it is now that the numbers are in place. And he's like, you know, like his light bulb just went, you know, off the charts of like, okay, this is like really eye opening. Then he was also able to cut back on expenses, do a lot of things. Needless to say, now he's basically retired because he thought he was going to like work five more years and then have this portfolio. But like after diving into his numbers and like getting what he really needed, he doesn't work hardly at all anymore in the business. And like he only has a few, you know, only sells a couple properties a year, only does, you know, has a small portfolio, but he's like, I'm good with where I am. And that to, he said, this has radically changed my life. And I was like, oh, wow there we go. That's it. You know, like I bet you I could help more people with this, especially in real estate investing since it's my background. So that's what started Simple CFO. And that's what birthed the, the company was seeing these investors, seeing like one where, you know, too much, you know, top line coming in, same going out, you know, right out the door to then seeing someone who like, once they got the numbers in place, how it transformed them. And they could say like, okay, we can really, we can really just retire now if we wanted to, and, you know, doing those types of things. So that to me was like, I want to provide this feeling more to investors and get them to where they want to be and and unlocking their numbers. So that's what got me started down that path. So tell me, what do you think creates this atmosphere? It seems like uh, I know a lot of entrepreneurs are just really busy, but real estate is a little bit different in that you got a lot of third parties Oh yeah, that affect what you can do. So you may be thinking, okay, I got to get over this hurdle, got to get over this hurdle, got to go over this hurdle. And so you just keep spending the money, hoping that you get over the hurdles because you're already in and it's so leveraged as well. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it, I don't think most businesses are as leveraged. So, and maybe they don't have as much third party. I mean, there's certainly some finance has a financial stuff has a lot of regulatory requirements and things. So, so tell me what you kind of think sets this up for this to occur. I'd say a lot of it is, I think it's most business owners though, even if it's not real estate, it's just the, the thought of, I need to spend more money in order to grow at any cost without knowing what to invest in, what to go after, what is that next thing. And that could be, like you said, the third parties, like could be someone helping them with the marketing, could be someone helping them just close the deals. It's like, what are the things that are actually providing the top line for us? What are those revenue generating activities or what are the, the best returns on what we spend our money on? And that's where I feel like a lot of people are scared of the financial side because we don't get basic financial management, much less for our personal finances, but even more so we don't get any for like the business side. And I've talked with a lot of people who have their MBAs and such, and they're like, they don't teach us money management. They just teach us like, you know, different marketing or like these other type things in our, in this program. And it's like, there you go. That's why most people then don't know what to do with their money once they get it. They Because in real estate, like you said, it's leverage, but it's also, there's also a million different things you could do with real estate. So chances are people are going to make money. If you stick in long enough, you're going to make money on the exit strategies if you're actually out there executing and making things happen. And that's where a lot of people get into the rat race again. They 
They don't know what they don't know about the finances. So they get scared. They don't want to look at it. They're just like, let me just keep throwing money. Hopefully I keep getting leads in the door. Or hopefully I keep getting, you know, there's properties that I can close on. And it just becomes a vicious cycle now of like they might have left a W-2 job and a rat race, but they just traded a 40 hour a week for rat race for an 80 hour a week rat race working for themselves. So it's like, that's where I feel like most just get into that. And then they're living paycheck to paycheck, deal to deal, because we don't get the financial, just basic cash management. How do we, how do we manage the money in the business? So that way, if we are making the money, we don't know we know what to spend it on in order to have profit and in order to keep the, keep the business going. So I think that's just one of the big things is we don't get that basic financial wherewithal from any, anywhere really. Yeah. I, I believe that. I think that's uh, maybe a curse of entrepreneurs to some extent because uh, anybody who, and you could be an intrapreneur as well, but an, an entrepreneur is going to be willing to take the risks for the reward they think they're going to get. And I have seen many entrepreneurs not watch cash. And so I think it's so important. And the reason I wanted to have uh, you on today was because I think that if we're really talking about creating a high trust business, you can't possibly have a high trust business if you don't have a high trust financial plan or understand where your cash is. Because cash is king. Um, because then the employees can never trust that the business is going to stay in business or provide the opportunities that they may want. And now with everybody leaving, I think it's more and more and more important that you got to be really financially savvy and sound. Yeah, I agree. And, And trust is so big in real estate. Like it doesn't matter what type of real estate you're doing. If you're wholesaling or if you're fixing flipping like HGTV, like trust is everything because like you had mentioned, Sue, there's a lot of leverage and they're getting money from either private lenders or friends and family, or they're getting money from banks or hard money lenders or like different avenues to be able to fund the properties and these flips and these projects. And that's where trust is everything. They're handling other people's monies to be able to go out, purchase the property, rehab it, sell it for a profit, then pay the lender back their principal plus interest, you know, making sure that that happens. And it is it's been incredible to see some people who just who miss who don't who mismanage that or who think short term of like oh I can I can you know accept this offer on this house even though I already accepted this one over here but I accepted another one because it was higher now I'm going to go back and tell this person theirs isn't anymore because I got a higher offer or whatnot you know it's like where some people just sacrifice the long for the short term and even with people's money too like we see this one of the big reasons i wrote the book i dedicate several several portions of several chapters of like not running into a ponzi scheme inside of a real estate company because we can get money for project a start project a run out of project a's money get project b's money and then start using it for project a you know because then it's like well now you're just now you're creating a domino effect here that's going to be very bad if once it catches up to you because now you're using this money that was for another project, you know, like not for the right project. So trust is huge. It's huge in the real estate investing realm and you're working with other people's money a lot too. So it is, it is paramount to be, to be above board all the time, or you're going to, you're going to lose big, like orange jumpsuit big and lose your reputation and not be able to do as much as you were able to before. And I'm thinking that it's even on the contractor's side that if you don't oh, yeah. manage your money well, the contractors, I see so many, uh, I, I, I'm a great fan of HGTV and uh, flipping shows. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, you see a lot of them where the, uh, the somebody, an investor purchased it and then it's now torn out, but they ran out of money. Yes. And so yep. from the contractors and the, con- and the contracting community, they're not going to be working for you. Right. They exactly. have totally lost trust. And so, you know, in a flipping type business or in a real estate business, you got to have a team of people. You're not going to be the one doing all that work. And yeah. if you don't have a team of people that trust you, you're, you're nowhere. Oh yeah. You know? Start yeah. from the top down. Yeah. So I, I yeah, it's, I just see that, you know, trust, creates the atmosphere no matter where you are, no matter what business it is. So, so how do you serve your clients? 
we serve as fractional CFOs, which is basically a part-time CFO because most businesses are too small to have a full-time CFO, you know, on staff, you know, a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars a year, but too large not to have someone helping them with the finances that actually speaks their language, you know, and speaks the language of the entrepreneur and not just CPA babble or bookkeeping babble, you know, like making sure that they have a a CFO who helps understand. Here's where your cash is. Here's how it's coming in. Here's how it's going out. Here's how we can project together. Here's like the, the numbers we need to be looking at. So that way we can keep profitability and that we can help you. So the CFO is a financial strategist on the team. It's the leader of the, the financial silo in organizations. So that's what how we help our clients is number one, finance. we have three pillars. Number one, financial clarity, making sure that they actually have books, numbers, like they feel in control of their numbers and know what's going on. Then number two is cash flow management, making sure they feel in control of their cash and know where it's going, set up the profit first system that we make sure that they implement as well to make sure that they have the cash and that not only they have it, but they know how to manage it. Then also we do some long-term planning as well too. What are you doing for retirement or like, how do you want to leave your legacy? Is that rentals? Is that multifamily? Is that commercial? Is that, you know, like different other exit strategies as well too? self-directed IRA investing, different things as well. So that's how we serve our clients is making sure that they have a plan to have their numbers because we've seen it over and over again. Having the numbers doesn't just equate to better business decisions, which it does. It also equates to more sleep at night, mm-hmm. having taking yes. vacations, like feeling secure, you know, having that control then over their mm-hmm. business because that's where most people feel out of control is with their money and their finances. Yeah. So two two questions came to my head then. Yeah is that uh, one, I want you to tell us more about profit first. I know it's sure. Mike's thing, but it's it's at the foundation for what your book is. Yep. And secondly, I want to talk more about wealth creation from your business. I cannot tell you how many people I know that are entrepreneurs and have significantly sized businesses mm-hmm. that they do not have wealth creation as one of their primary goals. Yeah. Yeah, it's sad. It's very sad. It's like you've got the vehicle, just need to focus on some of the right things for you. So, okay, let's. I remember. Tackle. I remember years ago when I was. I went. I went. I just sold my business and yeah. started this new business. But years ago, I mean, it's got to be twenty years ago. Uh, we calculated a number of money we had to have outside of retirement because I didn't want to wait till retirement yeah. uh, to be completely financial freedom. And, uh, and then we work towards that number, but I think that's rare. I mean, it's, it's sad. That's it rare. People make the money and they just spend it instead of investing it and, exactly. uh, and creating and creating wealth for themselves. So entrepreneurs out there, you're working really hard to create wealth for your family, financial freedom and wealth is lots of things. It's not just money, but you know, with money, you have the freedom to do those things that you will fulfill you. Exactly. So tell us more about profit first as a concept. Sure. Here we go. So buckle, buckle up. So this is, there's two parts to it. There's the mindset and then there's the actual practical application, which is why I love profit first and the whole concept in the book and everything where we've all been told the formula, say uh, probably from an accountant or probably from a bookkeeper or something, sales minus expenses equals profit. Meaning I make a sale. I pay everyone else and their mother. And then what I have left over is my profit at the end of the day or at the end of the year, or some, some far off event in the future that I hope one day happens because of all that I'm pouring in. But that's a broken formula because then that just perpetuates our, rat, our own rat race over and over again. Like you said, there's no focus there on the profitability or like having above and beyond of what we really need. So the formula, the profit first formula is sales minus profit equals expenses, meaning I make a sale, I allocate my profit first or take my profit first, and then my business is left over to spend the expenses on what it needs to grow and to build and whatnot and to for those expenses. And it's just that slight shift in the formula of focusing on profit, making sure that you are healthy, that you have that, that you actually have profit, and making sure that's a priority in your business, which 
sounds hilarious because when we get into business, I mean, we get into business for profit. Unless you start a nonprofit, your business should be profitable. Well, even but nonprofits need to make a profit. <laughs> right, exactly. And that's where we, right, we need to make sure though that we have that profitability. And it's just so many of us lose sight of that, that we think that we just have to pour in. We're the risk takers. Like, let's just dump everything into here. Then they wake up without cash one day and then it's like game over. So that's where this mindset is just something that's the huge part is just making profit a habit inside of your business, making sure that you're making profit a habit and not some far off event one day in the future or at the end of the year. So that's where we have the mindset, first of all. It also seems to me that this, um, actually from a practical, pragmatic methodology, uh, will allow you to create what you create will fit within that container that includes profit. Right. As opposed to letting the container grow to the size of the money you have. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's like Parkinson's law. That's what yeah. it is. It's like we we give ourselves enough time to what we allow. You know, so like if we give ourselves three weeks for a project, it'll take three weeks. If we give us three days, it'll take three days. So same thing with our money. If we've got a bunch of money in an account, we're gonna spend all that money that we see there because we're we're bank balance, you know, accounting. We're looking at our bank balances all the time as entrepreneurs. So yes, definitely agree with that. And making sure we actually remove that profitability first and take it first. Because I was just on a call yesterday with someone that's been implementing profit first for a while. And they're like, I don't know why this seems so logical, but actually taking our profit first, like we, we set now, what is our profit? Where do we want to be? And then we build everything around that. And then they're like, this just seems so logical now thinking about it, talking about it, but it didn't then, and it didn't dawn on us. But now that we've been doing it for a while, like that we get to control that. If we want to be very profitable, then we set it at this amount. And then we know that this is what we have to spend on everything else. Or if we want to grow the business, we might shrink the profit percentage a little bit and then invest more in, you know, our expenses and like growing the business. So, but there's always that profit there you know, we're making sure we're actually profitable. So that was just, that was seeing the mindset come to life in someone who's been doing it for a while. Of course, there there's, are, some, there's some pragmatic things to that too. Like you could want a hundred percent profit and you need a team of a hundred, probably right. not happening. Probably not <laughs> happening. Exactly. So you, we have to be practical in what and how we approach it. But yeah, it's like, we get to build that out first. Where do we want to be? How profitable do we want to? And then build it around that. Hi, this is Sue. Sorry to interrupt the episode, but I'm so excited that my new book, The Trusted Leader, is about to launch. And if it's after February 1st, 2022, then it's already out there. And so I'm so excited because for years, I've been asked to help leaders to create a high trust environment. We have worked for 35 years to go in and help leaders uh, through intervening and facilitating the development of high trust teams and businesses. And now I'm teaching leaders how to do this for yourself. And trust is so important because it's really like having your foot on the gas of your business. And in so many businesses, people are working so hard, but their foot is on the brake as well. And so you expend a lot of time, energy, resources, and you just can't get where you should or could get. And so I hope you will go and get the book now and start your trusted leader journey. You can go to www.sudico, S-U-D-Y-C-O, dot com slash book and you can get the book there and you can pre-order the book there or you can get it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble or anywhere that you get your books. But I hope you'll go and get it and start reading it. I can't wait to get your feedback and to be on a trusted leader journey with you. Let's get back to the show. Then the actual practical steps, like how do we make this practical? Because as a real estate investor myself, we I've read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I've read, you know, The Richest Man in Babylon. Like a lot of these books that say pay yourself first or a portion of all I have is mine to keep. So we get that mindset. I get it as a, as a real estate investor. But until I had read Profit First and started implementing, I didn't see it 
in action, you know, and like seeing the the mindset fulfilled. So it was like, this was why I like this second step of profit first, which is all about how do we make that happen, which I'll give you just one the the big step in profit first is if you've ever heard of the envelope system, Dave Ramsey's made that popular, a lot of people have made that popular where you might do it yourself currently where you put your personal expenses in different envelopes, you know, like for your groceries for your gas, you know, like different things like that. So that's where in business, we need to make sure we have specific envelopes or we set up physical bank accounts to separate out our money. Because one of the biggest things we see with real estate investors, especially that we work with, but all entrepreneurs is having that one big bank account where everything comes in and everything goes out of that one account. It's basically just a cash salad that we're tossing all the time. One day we feel like a king because we've got a bunch of money in there. The next day we feel like a pauper because we can't rub two pen, you know, two nickels together in that account. So that's where starting to focus on the right things, making sure you're a healthy business and a healthy business owner. So how do we do that? What are those accounts to set up? Like what are those envelopes that you need? I call them in my book, the golden trio of accounts, because I'm a big, big movie nerd, movie buff person. So I like the big stories like Star Wars, Harry Potter, you know, like all those ones that have like the three main heroes in them, like Luke Han Leia that are always pushing the story forward for good, making sure that good wins in the end. Well, your business is your epic story. It's your epic saga. Like you're playing out your own movie with your business. Like you are the hero. You are making sure you need to make sure that you win in the end. So what are those heroes in your business? What are those bank accounts that can help you? Number one, profit. Number two, owner's compensation. Number three, owner's tax. So those are three accounts that are for you, the owner. So let me differentiate. What are the differences between those three? The profit account is something you take quarterly, which is the reward for making a successful business where you put your blood, sweat, tears, like I said, trading 40 hours to work 80 hours for yourself. It's something that you give yourself as a reward at the end of a quarter. The owner's compensation is different from profit because that's what you pay yourself like on a consistent salary. Like if you're working inside your business, you should be paid because one day you'll probably want to replace yourself. And you'll want to put someone else in there as CEO and you'll just want to be the owner or you might want to sell it in the future or whatnot. You need to make sure you've built in there that the, you've got a salary for yourself. Maybe that could be W-2, that could be distributions, however you're set up. But that should be on a regular basis, like weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, however often you pay yourself. Owner's taxes, making sure that you're saving for taxes throughout the year. Because if you have that one big account, you know, like you're, you're just spending money all the time, then tax time comes at the end of the year or the beginning of the next year. And you're like, oh, shoot, I have to go sell more. I have to do more deals or whatever, just to cover my tax bill, or I've got to be on a payment plan or whatnot, and then scrambling at the end of the year. So making sure you separate out what is owed to the government that you're going to have to owe. So making sure that you have those three accounts, which serves the business owner. Then there's another account, which I call the income account. And I call it the control account as well, where it all the money comes in, all deposits, and it just sits there until you transfer it to those other accounts. Because that's the difference between having one big account where just deposits go in, expenses go out. Now we're going to have money go into one account and you control where the money goes now. You know that I can put this to profit. I could put this to the expenses. I could put this to the taxes, making sure that you actually are in control of the cash movement and the cash inside of your business. Then you already have an operational expense account. That's the fifth fundamental account to pay your, the OPEX account to pay your expenses from. So those are the, that is the fundamental of if you separate out your money, you won't be tempted to just use anything that's in one big account and be, you know, which you could be stealing from your profit, or you could be stealing from yourself or from uncle Sam and, you know, making sure that you're protecting yourself. And honestly, this is, I know this podcast is all about trust, but this helps the entrepreneur be trust themselves better. This helps them know, like I can, I could trust myself that we're going to be profitable and that I don't have to scramble or I don't have to get a loan just to cover my expenses or whatnot in the future. You know, like I can, I can do these things and put some, put some processes and systems in place like this to be able to manage cash from my perspective. Because if you, 
if you've noticed here, I didn't talk about a balance sheet or a profit and loss or like your assets and liabilities and equity or any of that right now. I'm talking about just cash that you as the entrepreneur could go out, set up a bank account because we already look at our bank accounts way more as owners than our QuickBooks accounts usually. So going out there, looking at that, and making sure that you can manage it at least at that level. So that way you could go out there and be profitable. The biggest objection I always get is like, that's a bunch of a bank accounts. I'm like, okay, number one, this is for you. That golden trio of accounts, that's for you. But if you still don't like it, set up at least one account, call it profit and transfer 1% of all income into that account. The point of the system is to be profitable is to make profit a habit inside of your business. If that's the only thing you took away from this podcast, I would, I would say be a success. Do that one thing, open one account, call it profit, transfer 1%. So that's a practical application of making the mindset come to life that we read in all these different books. And I know that this, uh, this is for entrepreneurs and uh, many of our listeners and clients are, um, you know, have bigger business, like 50 million to a billion dollars, the same practical stuff is required is you need to make sure in whatever division or unit or uh, segment, however you're, you're developed is that is that you have some kind of profit mindset. Uh, and, and I know in large corporations, because of bureaucracy, a lot of times that gets lost. Right. Um, or because it just is, they're not close enough to it. The, the people that are actually executing are not close enough to it. So I think the concepts uh, can be transferred to no matter what size of business you have, uh, because you just need to make sure, and even if you're a nonprofit or you're a, a government organization, you need to make sure what you're doing has enough profit, enough margin in it so that if there's a problem, you can take care of it. If you grow, you can, uh, you can add people to it uh, to the extent that you're allowed. Sometimes there's regulations and that's not allowed, but uh, certainly uh, I think that all of us that run businesses could get more profit out of it if we focused on it uh, more and maybe we wouldn't uh, buy the new car, the new truck, the new whatever it is. Um, and thinking terms more of, well, maybe maybe we can get a little more out of it before we do, or there's a discipline around it. And you did talk about trusting yourself, because to me, this whole thing is about whoever is in charge of the cash or the strategy of an organization, which is where the money is going to get allocated to, yep. uh, is really about trusting yourself. And in the trust hierarchy, trusting yourself is the first rung. Yeah. So, you know, if you can't trust yourself around cash, which is sort of why you need all these accounts, because you can't trust yourself with the cash. I know for, for us, we have uh, in the ledger, we have accounts where we just take out money every month. So it's the same thing as you would have in an account. We just have it all in the ledger. So it's coming out. So uh, we can see how much is we don't have, <laughs> how right. much is allocated to different things. So it needs to be allocated. In a, in a way. And uh, it makes sense to have it far away if you can't trust yourself for sure. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it doesn't, we've worked with several bigger businesses and it is, it's like, it's being able to trust that you have a system in place. Cause a lot of places just don't have a, a simple system to make sure that the, the cash exactly. is managed. And sometimes the people that are leading, you know, don't always have the background in finance or, you know, that education. So it's like, here's a simple system to be on the same page with everyone in the organization, like no matter where they sit, could be able to see, okay, we have this designated for this account, you know, and this is where it's going to go, you know, and like, this is how we're going to manage it. So that's another thing that I think is huge about this system, because it's not, it's like, not, you don't have to have an accounting degree for this for this type of management, the cash flow management here. No, and it, it's a it's a simple, pragmatic approach mm -hmm. that can be adapted to really any size. I mean, you yep. might might be executed in a different way, but it, the concepts of it can be can be something that could be quite significant. Um, you know, even one percent profit difference, if you're a billion dollar firm, is a lot of money. Oh yeah, yes, indeed. <laughs> so, you know, um, the other thing is, is that we haven't talked about, we talked about this a little bit in the beginning, but um, really taking that money that you have as profit. And uh, certainly I like to have enough uh, operating 
I like to have a year's worth of operating cash. Yes. I mean, that's just how I am. Six months would be the minimum for me. I'm not comfortable with that, but most people, most people would say that's too much money. Uh, but uh, for me, that's where mine is. But beyond that, whatever that number is, then investing it in something that can uh, achieve a return. And yes, you're investing in your business, but divesting from just your business into other things where you can actually build wealth beyond your yeah. business. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then, you know, it's like uh, the book, The Millionaire Next Door. I don't know if you ever read that one. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. You know, it talks about how <clears throat> look around your neighborhood and the people that are run, driving the older cars and maybe have lived in their house for 35 years. Uh, they're the millionaires. Right. Yes. <laughs> and they're not flashing fancy things. And yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, so, what are some of the, well, first, one question I want to ask you is, do you is you do you only your your um uh, partial CFO is that only for real estate type businesses or do you serve all sorts of different types of entrepreneurial businesses? Oh, no, we do serve other types of of businesses. That was just my background. That's where I first got into the business and built that foundation from there. But now we're working with lots of different types of businesses now. So you're seeing a whole, you know, that's why you know it it happens everywhere. It doesn't exactly. it isn't special yes. in real estate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, what other things can you offer as advice to the uh we call them our trust builders here uh for things they can do to create more trust in their either in their financial management or in learning how to create more profit, you've probably seen these patterns in the businesses you're serving. Like how did they end up getting more profit or, or any other advice that you might have? Yeah. So one of the accounts that I didn't mention just because I wanted to do the foundational, but if you, if you get any type of money from any other place, what's friends, family, invest in your business, what's just say, or it's institutional financing, or it could be whatever, it could be private yeah, venture money, capital money. or venture whatever. capital. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I always recommend setting up a different account just for that, because then using it for its intended purpose, you know, because in the real estate investing realm, this happens all the time. We don't want to like use the money for something that's not, you know, for not the right project. Same thing in any type of business, making sure that you have a separate account. So it's that kind of like the idea of an escrow account. So it it's not typically yeah, exactly. more like it's in, in an escrow account and you only draw from that for the appropriate things. So that exactly. you don't spend it. Because that's where I've talked with a lot of lenders who know about profit first. And they're like, we love it when people are on profit first, because not only do we know that they're more savvy with their money, usually, and the cash management, but they've usually got an account for us, you know, so that way they're not like mingling all this stuff together and they have no idea what's going on with their money. So that does, it builds trust. It builds a lot of trust in those people. And, you know, like, I really like that from that perspective. Then your second question kind of around profitability is, if you get this system and if you get the, the concepts and the discipline and the principles behind it, the big thing is you'll focus more on the profitability. And so your profit will go up. Like people who start setting up the accounts and having this and like start sectioning this out, start seeing their, their business net worth go up, you know, like their equity in their business and like the cash reserves. And they start to get to a much healthier place, which in turn gives them I talk about this when I wrote this book, I dedicated a whole chapter to reserves for the real estate investing community, which, but this could be for any business owner who's that type A entrepreneur that wants to invest every dollar. I talk about how reserves grow your business because people want to see cash if it's outside lenders or whatnot. And, but the biggest thing I think too, is once you have that reserve, like you were talking about that six to 12 months, it gives you the mental space to not have to take bad deals, not having to go after that next thing. Like, oh, I got to make the sale or we're going to be out of business next month. So instead of operating from fear all the time, you're operating from a place of purpose. You're able to say, this is the purpose of the business. This does not align with our values. This does not align with who we are. I don't have to take this. In real estate investing, that might be a slim deal, you know, like something that doesn't have a lot of margin and they're like trying to, oh, can we do this? You know, but we got to get this next thing. And that's where I see a lot of people where once you have the reserve, that gives them, lets them take a deep breath lets them sleep better, lets them actually do and make decisions from what they actually want to do with their business instead of just running around like a chicken with their head cut off all the time. So I think it just helps us 
take the, we forget the psychological impact, especially if we've never had reserves in place. Some of that, that's a foreign concept of like, I thought, you know, my business, I just had to invest every dollar. There shouldn't be any money, you know, anytime <laughs> out there. So it's, it's like called a nonprofit or right, exactly. a poorly run nonprofit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's where we just have to make sure focusing on that, getting those reserves in place, how, what is appropriate for you? And then what are we investing after that? The other thing that comes to my mind is that I believe that the holy grail for most entrepreneurs and business owners and leaders is to sell their business. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to sell your business, you have to have the more profit you have, the more you're going to get for it. Of course, the number one thing to increase your multiplier is goodwill. Mm. Uh, and I think that the profitability along with your money management definitely has an impact on the goodwill you have, oh, because do you pay your bills on time? Do you pay your people on time? Do you, you know, can you be generous to when there's an error? Can you, all these things, uh, your, your money management uh, is so much a part of creating the ability to create goodwill. Yeah. And uh, so, and, and I think most people want to sell their businesses. There's also a lot of people who have businesses now that are getting ready to retire and will in a succession process will want to transfer their business to someone or sell it to someone. And again, the price you pay for that business, the multiplier will be based on your profit yep. and your goodwill. No, that's, that's a great point. Yeah. So I, you know, I just think that it's a, it's such an essential thing and it's so easy to not focus on it. <laughs> yeah, it really is. It it's seems counter counterintuitive that it wouldn't be, but it's easy once easy to lose sight when you're in the grind day to day and just your nose buried and, you know, moving forward. Sometimes Especially it's Especially if you feel overwhelmed. Oh, yeah. And when you feel overwhelmed financially is when you stop looking at it because it's the, you don't want to look at it. Right. Exactly. It's a, it's a self-defeating cycle. Yeah. So where can people find out more about you, more about your book? Yeah. So if you go to simple CFO solutions.com, that's where we have there, we actually have the book as one of the tabs at the top. So that's where it connects you to Amazon or book buying or whatever there. So that's one place. And then also we got a podcast too, Profit First REI podcast on there. And then and that's where our services are held as well too. So got a couple of different things. If you just go to that, that site, simplecfosolutions.com. Excellent. Thank you. So I always like to end with uh, an action step people can take. So uh, from what, all the lessons you've learned in helping, you know, hundreds of companies, What's a lesson you learned that you would like to share with everyone that they should start doing today in order to improve, improve their trust of themselves in their money management? Well, I'm going to say it again. Open that one account, call it profit and transfer 1%. Start getting in the habit of being a profitable business and proving to yourself that you can hold reserves and that you can have true profit in your company. So that's a new definition of becoming the 1%, I think. Right. Yeah. Part of the 1%. <laughs> right. Yep. That's great. Excellent. Well, I want to thank you so much for being a part of Lead with Trust and sharing your insights. Uh, I love it when people have a broad view across, but also specifics. And of course, I love real estate. So <laughs> awesome. Thank you so <laughs> much. Good. Thank you so much. Hey, I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Lead with Trust and that wherever you're listening to this podcast, you will subscribe. And if you enjoyed this episode, send it to someone who you think can really use this message that you got today. And also, please leave us a review. You know, your honest review wherever you listen to your podcast would be much appreciated. And of course, the more reviews we get, the better they are, the better for the podcast. I'm truly on a mission to get more and more people to understand that trust is the essential element. So I hope you'll be part of that. You know, this show really exists to help you leaders to build your business on a foundation of trust 
so that you can reap the rewards of becoming that top performer in your market. I see over and over where no one can possibly reach the levels of those people that understand how to build a high trust culture in their business. Now today, if you're really curious about starting your trusted leader journey, you can get started right away if you just take the free trusted leader profile and you can learn where you fall along the trusted leader continuum. And this really can unlock your confidence on where you are and what you need to do. It's very specific on what you can do. Gives you a snapshot of your leadership style. So if you want to take that, just go to www.sudyco.com and then forward slash profile, and you will get immediate access to the trusted leader profile. Once again, that is www.sudyco.com forward slash profile. All right, that's a wrap. I just can't wait to hang out with you again on our next episode.